So I think uh, one of the main things that you want to think about is sort of these delays serve a useful purpose because we're trying to find out how these medical products work, how well they work, and if they're safe, etc. The question is how much or how long are we trying to figure that out relative to how much we learn if we didn't have this regulatory process. So it's a very long process, it's unique to medical products that it takes a decade to go through the regulatory process. The only other part of the economy where that's the case is sort of public works, infrastructure, etc. if you build a highway or something of that nature. But if you're for, lucky, it's only yeah, a decade. Exactly. <laughs> but for consumer products, it's a kind of unique, a very long delay. And the question then becomes, what are the costs and benefits of that delay? And the costs are presumably that people don't see valuable treatments as quickly as they do, so they die waiting for treatment, let's say in cancer and other uh, disease categories. Uh, and, and the benefit is that you learn more about the efficacy or safety of the product. But my research has generally shown that, you know, even though we, there's a value to safety and efficacy, we've kind of gone too far in terms of uh, trying to, in terms of the length it takes to generate that evidence. So that, you know, if you went faster, the, the benefit of getting f products faster to patients would uh, dominate the cost involved of getting more unsafe or uh, less uh, 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 effective products on the market. you do nothing, there might certainly be that issue, but we're not doing nothing. We have something called product liability, which is if you, uh, and also truthful advertising. So if you actually go on the market and untruthfully advertise your product, or you have a product that's defective, etc., you can bear, you know, very strong financial consequences for that decision. What that does is essentially saying, post-marketing of the product, we have a way to discipline people to not uh, either advertise or market harmful products. What FDA does is pre-marketing, trying to prevent that. And I think that that dual aspect of FDA is, is poorly recognized that, you know, in most consumer product markets, we discipline that after the fact on the market and therefore prevent it on the market because the manufacturers are afraid of it happening. So whenever you have a <clears throat> withdrawn drugs, you have enormous liability exposure for these companies as well, which they're trying to avoid, obviously. And the question is, um, when FDA tried to discipline that uh, uh, behavior before we go to market, what marginal value in addition to disciplining it once you come on the market do you have? So I'm, I'm going to argue the opposite, which is the FDA, when I talk to people in the life sciences industry, they tend to say that FDA is not the problem, that FDA has been pretty good about developing biomarkers and other means of assessing improvement. And what happens is when you actually want to get the, pr the product reimbursed uh, and you go to the payers, they say, well, this isn't enough. Showing that you lowered the cholesterol or lowered um, uh, the amount of amyloid plaque is not enough to convince me that I should pay for these and I want to see more data. So in some sense, already this is happening and because the payers are asking for additional information, especially in the case where you have biomarkers available. Yeah, I think the reimbursement delays on top of the regulatory delays are very important to discourage, you know, manufacturers from investing in these uh, products. I agree. Yeah. But the question, yeah, but the don't work so well. It also illustrates that the payers are basically, in this case, public payers, Medicare and Medicaid, will discipline uh, efficacy or safety, uh, presumably as well, before they start paying for things. So, it, you know, in the extreme case, if they are the final arbitrator. No, no, no company is going to go to the market unless they get reimbursed. And if they're the final arbitrator, we would need the FDA in some sense uh, on the efficacy. And you see this in the private uh, payer space too. Where you, you know, most cost-effectiveness studies in, in pharmaceuticals is not done for the European markets where you have cost-effectiveness required by institutional. Uh, mandates such as NICE in the UK or, or other countries. Most cost-effectiveness studies for drugs are done 
for the U.S. market for private payers, even though the public payers, Medicare and Medicaid, are prohibited from using cost effectiveness data to determine reimbursement. And I think that's a sign that the private payers are really interested in, you know, is this working? Is it cost effective? Is it valuable for us to actually reimburse this? And that's presumably disciplines companies uh, uh, from doing this. And when, you ask, when I say most, I mean the cost effectiveness registry at Tufts, which is kind of a universe of cost effectiveness studies. If you look at those, most of them, the vast majority of them are done for U.S. markets, presumably for private payers as the public payers are banned from using them. Sure. Uh, so let me change gears a little bit because I think, you know, you can increase access to new innovation through regulatory reform and streamlining regulation, which you've just articulated. But the other thing you could do is lower the costs of clinical trial development. And one of the issues has been, especially, um, you know, we saw this in COVID, it, it's very hard to enroll people in clinical trials, especially the representative populations that are sometimes most afflicted by a condition or disease uh, or uh, infectious agent. And so one of the points you've advocated, for example, is that we should be paying uh, participants uh, who are basically doing something out of altruism. They're donating their data to society to inform treatment. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the speed of trials are very much uh, slowed down uh, because it's difficult to recruit uh, patients into the trial. So think of another, in a, in a regular company, if you're trying to recruit a labor force, it would be very difficult to do that if you don't pay it any wages or you didn't pay the, the workers any wages. And very few would be interested in it. It would be a very slow process of looking for workers who wanted to work there as an apprentice or whatever. And, and, and I think, you know, in that regard, I think it's, it's misguided. But what people, when, pe when you talk about compensation and trial, people really get a bad ethical, uh, sort of have a bad ethical view of it because there was a lot of problems with the early trials uh, of uh, uh, syphilis in African American men, etc. in the U.S. that has colored uh, this kind of whole trial regulation process through IRBs. But that's an issue of, you know, informed consent. Are you understanding exactly what the trial is, is doing? Are you voluntarily participating in a trial? That's a separate issue from compensation for participating in, in, an, in, in an informed consent trial. I, I, well, let me add on to that because I've done a little bit of research on this myself. And when you talk to bioethicists, in fact, the people who have the resources and means to participate in these clinical trials are more affluent, they have stronger social support. So it turns out that the, when you don't compensate patients, what you get is a more wealthy population. They tend to get their care at academic medical centers. So ironically, there's a certain element of, uh, uh, it, it's in some some would view it as unethical to say that we shouldn't that we are basing our our decisions on treatment on very selected populations who already have the means to be able to participate as subjects and a more ethical approach would be to say we want representation that's broad in clinical trials and therefore we should reimburse so that everyone has access and availability and that the data will be available. So I would actually turn it on its head and argue that it's unethical in the current system where people are relying on the altruism of essentially uh, wealthier individuals to figure out what, how we should practice medicine. Yeah, there's an equity component to it in some sense if you're, if you're studying richer populations only in the yeah, trials. Exactly. Uh, and the question is, you know, it's also viewed as, as only benefiting pharmaceutical companies who will go faster to market, but I think that's the wrong view. The right view is that pharmaceutical companies will finance these trial expenditures of compensating subjects from future revenue. That future revenue presumably comes from future patients in the disease class who are willing to pay for the product. And those are the patients benefiting from the information generated in the trial. So it's really a transfer, allowing a transfer 
from people in the disease who are benefiting from the information generated on the, on the treatment of the disease in the trial to compensate those people in the trial for giving them that information. And the pharmaceutical is really, or the company, pharmaceutical company is just really a middleman in, in that process. Well, I, I've talked to pharmaceutical companies about this, and they are on both sides of this issue. Some of them like the idea that they don't have to pay <laughs> to get patients, and they don't see it as a trade-off in terms of speed, whereas there are others who believe you know, we really need to get subjects enrolled and probably take a more enlightened view. So I think even the companies get it wrong. I think, I think, I think it depends on the disease. So Thanks. certain diseases, you have excess supply of observations. We saw that with HIV patients, who the only way they could get treatment was in the trial. But certain, most diseases, you have an excess demand for patients. That is to say, you don't have enough patients relative to the supply of patients in that disease category is willing to participate. So for the companies that are in disease classes, such as COVID also, I think was an excess supply of, of, of uh, patients as opposed to many companies in the cancer space I know has a huge excess demand for patients in trials because they're also competing with a ton of other trials. And, and I think so, I think companies can come down differently on this in, in terms of whether they have enough patients around or not to recruit freely. Right, so it depends on the yeah. therapeutic area yeah. and the like. But I think, just to summarize, it's very clear uh, from your research and our research at the Schaefer Center that, you know, if we want to, the world is better off if we can accelerate access to innovation and lower the costs and do that in a responsible way. And part of that is dealing with regulatory reform and part of that is maybe changing the incentives. Uh, for people to participate in research. Is yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, I th but I think also the incentive part aside, I think COVID illustrated that, you know, fast development can be extremely successful. Yeah. So the question, you know, why do we have this slow type of development process uh, when, when it's not necessarily so bad to go fast? Uh, <laughs> and, and I think, you know, it's something that regulators or lawmakers more uh, precisely, who need to change the FDA uh, statutes as opposed to the, the FDA personnel who are just acting within those statutes, need to consider more. Yeah, no, and I, I will tell you, as a patient who has type 1 diabetes, I was diagnosed about 25 years ago, and I remember saying to myself, I just have to take care of myself for 20 years and they'll have a cure. Well, here it is, 25 years later, they're getting closer to a cure, but they're not quite there yet. So I really wish they'd move a little faster, so. <laughs> there you go. Great. Okay.